Hello. Who? Oh. Hello, how's it going? Are we feeling pumped? Yeah? Especially the pink t-shirt team over there. Hello. Amazing. Amazing awesome. effort. Awesome. So my name is Richard. And I'm Raul. Uh, and together we run iteratorlearning.com, which is uh, a training company. And we run a bunch of training courses around core Java topics. Richard, it's iterator with a DO because we're totally hipster. Look at that bit. Thank you very bit. much. Excellent. Uh, but we're here to deliver a talk about uh, Java 9, some Java line core library changes, polishing the diamond. Fantastic. And we're also going to use another Java 9 feature to demo those library changes, which is the REPL J shell. So there are no slides in this talk. Who needs slides, right? Just a black and white terminal. Let's yes. do it, Richard. Yes, Thank 2017. You. Thank you. Awesome. So, um, Richard, what's the um, table of content for this talk? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so we uh, have got a few different things to talk about in this talk. First, we're going to talk about some collection factory methods. Uh, so some nice uh, verbosity reducing library uh, changes. Uh, then we'll talk about some streams improvements in Java 9, right? My favorite library enhancement coming from Java 8, the stream API. We'll so also talk about improvements to the collectors uh, API. Then we'll talk about optional. Um, and then we're going to conclude this talk and, and wrap up the different uh, things we've seen, different threads that we've seen. So Richard, NFTs, let, let's get started. How does this, um, hold on, does it do maths as well, this J shell that you mentioned? Can you do one plus two? Yeah, we can do one plus two. One Amazing. plus two is three. Take my money. <laughs> How much money will you give us for one plus three equals three? Uh, we'll talk later, we'll talk later. Okay, okay, that's a good negotiating tactic. Um, so it will evaluate arbitrary Java expressions. We can add one plus two equals three, uh, but we could also, for example, uh, put a statement in here so we can say uh, system out println, hello world. Fantastic, we get hello world printed on the screen, but we can also evaluate more complicated uh, Java statements and we're going to be writing all our code in the REPL. So a lot of programming languages, including things like Python and Scala, have this REPL as well. So it's great that Java has it as well now. It's really useful for interactively learning or making use of a new API maybe that you want to import or have a play. See if this thing works. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's talk about collections. Go on to talk about collections. Actually, what's the biggest thing that people hate about Java? Question to the audience. What's the biggest thing that people hate about Java? Serialization. <laughs> Richard, <laughs> you can't be asking this question. Like, we're going to have too many things here. Yeah. Raul, what's the biggest thing that people hate about Java? I love Java. There's nothing wrong with Java. Uh, I'm actually really like Java, robust language, but I've been doing a lot of Python lately, and I feel like Python is you know, a little bit more concise. It's less to write. So Java is great if you're paid by the lines of code um, and the characters. Yeah. Uh, but all in all, a great programming language that helps you write code that is robust and deploy applications. But so we want something a bit more succinct, is what you're saying. It's, that would be nice. You know, I wouldn't say no to that. Though I do kind of agree with the guy in the audience that serialization does suck. So let's take a, a little very simple uh, example of just adding some words into a list, right? So uh, we've got a, an array list here. Capital L. Thanks. Amazing. Uh, and then we're going to add in some words there. So we're going to say uh, some hello, hello, world, from Java. OK, so our words list does have those words, hello, world, from Java in. So that's good. But oh, man, it's just, just so verbose to be adding all that stuff in. Is there a better option that we have? Uh, come on, Richard. You know, um, in Java 5, I believe, you know, this arrays that as list factory method was added. Why don't you use that to make things a little bit more concise? So you're saying when I do uh, arrays dot as list, hello world from Java. That is a lot better. That is a lot better. But this arrays that as list construct has a few interesting characteristics related to it, right? It's returning us uh, a list of string, the words, but it's not really the same array list type that we have 
on the uh, example we saw earlier. If we see the, what the class is for this, it's the arrays class with this array list inner class, which is a different array list version. Well, and that's got some implications, hasn't it? Well, why don't we uh, just try and add another element? Like, what about PHP? Excellent. Let's try that. Unsupported operation. Fantastic. Java is helping us not have any PHP in our code base. This is an amazing language feature. We want more of this. Awesome. Excellent. I love it. I love it. Um, but Richard, you know, it looks like this kind of um, this instance that we've got here is, might be a bit peculiar. What about the method set that still yeah. lets you modify uh, an element inside that list? Would that work? Ooh. Oh, that's bad. That's worked. Hello, world from PHP. Sorry. Sorry. There's we're a bug in this code. We're living a nightmare here. We're living a nightmare, yeah. So arrays.asList is an array wrapped up as a list. So you can modify or replace the elements in question, but you can't add or remove from it. It feels like it should be immutable, but it's not really immutable. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a peculiar situation, Richard. Um, so is there anything better that was added in Java 9? Absolutely there was. So Java 9 adds some... Uh, factory methods for collections. So I'm just going to start writing just hello world here. And that gives us a list with just the uh, words hello and world in. Can you now add anything to it? Can we add anything to it? So let's just assign it to a variable so we can play around with it. So if we try and add PHP, boom, we can't add PHP. Fantastic. What about set? If we want to inject PHP into the first element, we can't do it there. Lovely. It's, it's in a genuinely immutable list. But it's, it is, even though it's immutable, it's got some interesting characteristics here. It's still implementing the regular Java list method. So you still have all those mutative operations on there, but they will tell you you can't perform them. So if you say words that get classed, then you know, what will be returned? Because in previous example, we saw this internal kind of arrays, array list class. So what it's is this? this? It's this internal uh, list implementation from the immutable collections class. So the, it, it's like a hidden implementation class that's not really exposed particularly, but is instantiated through the list of factory methods. So that's really where you're meant to get at, at it from. Fantastic. <coughs> um, well, Richard, what about um, does does this work with sets, for example? Yeah. So that's another restriction on the array start as listing. If you want to have a different type of collection, like a set or a queue, you have to instantiate it and then pass it to another thing. Then we'll copy all the elements over and what have you. Whereas here we can just say a uh, set dot of hello world. Nice and simple. Now you program Python sometimes, don't you? Yeah. Um, and Python has a syntax that's a bit like this, isn't it? Where you can just say hello world with some uh, square brackets around it. I mean, you have to make those string literals, but that would work. Yeah, so, um, and it's really handy, right? You don't have to, to write, uh, you know, the list dot off. It's a bit more concise, and it feels and looks like we're working with an array. So let's pretend that you're Brian Goetz or Alex Buckley or Stuart and Mark, and, you know, kind of maintaining the, the Java programming language. You've got the secret keys here, Richard. Why can't we have this syntax available in Java? It looks pretty simple, right? What's well, the problem? I don't necessarily want to put words in their mouth as such, but as far as I'm aware, uh, the main problem here is that every time you make these kind of changes where you add extra syntax, there's a lot of overhead, a lot of, a lot of cost associated with it, where just adding some factory methods ends up giving you most of the same benefit for much, much less cost. Yeah, it's a lot easier to test and maintain a library as well than testing and maintaining language features. It's Absolutely. A higher Absolutely. engineering cost. So we get essentially 80% of the benefits for way more reduced costs. So that's why, well, it's one of the reasons uh, why factory methods were added. Absolutely. So let's try and uh, have a look at maps as well, because they've got some of the interesting uh, method here. So we have a map dot of, and you're from Brussels, aren't you? Anyone from Belgium here in the house? Yes. Well done, Excellent. Belgium. Go Brussels and Antwerp, obviously. How many people live in Brussels? I'm glad you asked, Richard. Uh, I looked that up uh, before coming here. So it's 1,139,000 people that live in Brussels. Excellent. Mm. Um, well, you're, from, you're from Cardiff. Yes. Is anyone else from Wales here in the house? <laughs> 
That's Come okay. on. That's all right. I'm your friend. It's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, well, I'm, dis I'm lonely. Um, okay. Well, Cardiff, it turns out, does have more people in. I mean, I don't even live in Cardiff these days. But it does have more people in than one. It's got 341,000 people in there. So we can instantiate a map here from the, the city name onto the number of people who live there with this map dot of... Uh, uh, factory method. But there's a, a thing with this map that of, like the other ones we saw were Varag's factory method. So you could create an arbitrary size map dot of, or set dot of, or list dot of, but we can't do that with maps, can we? Well, we can't, and there's the other downside. If I look at your declaration here, uh, it, I could easily make a typo. It's not quite clear what different values are. It looks like you're kind of switching between key and values. But especially if you've got a long line, mm. it might be harder to tell what exactly is the key and what exactly is the value. So is there a more kind of idiomatic way of uh, instantiating those maps, uh, Richard? Yeah, well, so what there is is a uh, factory method for the, the map.entry uh, interface, which was also added to create immutable entry objects. We've actually just, that's on the map interface, we just statically imported it here. So you can use that to create entries. And in fact, there is also a... Uh, map dot of entries method using some of the uh, tab completion in the REPL there that takes an entry with the two cities. Lovely stuff. So we've, we've that does take a var arg. So we can take a var args argument with all the entries in. Okay. Excellent. So Java a bit more succinct here, less verbose. Absolutely, a bit more succinct, a little bit less verbose. Let's take a look at what else we're going to be talking about today. We want to talk for an hour about collection factory methods. Let's talk about streams for a while. Yes. As I said, uh, well, hold on, let's see. Anyone is a fan of the stream API? Everybody. Awesome. Amazing. Awesome. So there's a few goodies that were added in the stream API just to make uh, our life a little bit easier and become a bit more productive on a day-to-day -day basis. So Richard, there's uh, this new factory method that was added called of nullable. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Yeah, so to, to explain what the old nullable is for, we'll, we'll write a little bit of streams code. So our first version is going to be a Java 8 version. So what we're going to do is we're going to have some uh, configuration locations. And uh, we want to find the first configuration location in our list of things. So we'll see if we've got an app home property set for our application. And we'll put some stuff into that. And if that's missing, we'll back off to the user's home directory as a place to store information to. So uh, well, let's take our app home and our user.home property, because that's where the, the Java property for home directories is, and create a stream out of those two values. And what we want to do is, if they're present, we want to uh, plot that. We want to find the first one of these that's present, basically. OK? So what we can do here is we could uh, flat map each property name. What's the flat map operator? Here for Raoul. So flat map is this awesome method that everybody loves, I can tell. And it takes a, uh, a function that's going to return a stream. So that's going to happen for every element in the input stream, and then they'll get nested into a continuous stream. So what Richard is going to do here is to implement a function that's going to return a stream that contains a, the, the value of that property, if it's available. If it's not, he will return an empty stream, OK? And that means this way we can get rid of all those properties that don't actually have a value. And that's where flat map comes in. So we're making use of a couple of uh, different factory methods here. So stream empty to return empty stream. We need to get our brackets and uh, parentheses right, uh, Richard? Yeah, well, I wonder if I have got it right. Fingers. That's one of the fun things about this talk. Amazing. Is find out if that actually works. Ooh, a fantastic. Yeah, so what we've done here is we've taken the property. If it's absent, if the value returned was null, we returned an empty stream. Otherwise, we wrap that value up in a stream. And we just called the find first method on the stream to find the first property that was there. So if we'd set app home, it would have returned that. Otherwise, user.home was set, so it returned Raoul's home directory. But looking at this code here, can you put your hands up if you really, really love this code? Can what? you put your hands up if you really, really hate this code? OK. What so if you paid by lines of code? Then it's good, right? Then it's good. What about if you kind of like you mildly dislike it? 
Anyone mildly dislike it? That's always a popular option, mild dislike. Fantastic. Yeah, so I quite mildly dislike it as well. And in fact, there's a better option for us for doing this in Java 9, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, so ideally, we like to be making use of methods that help us write code that reads closer to the to problem statement here. And clearly, we, we're dealing with the case that something is nullable. And we, we are having to implement this workaround using flat maps. So um, thankfully, a new method was added, Richard. Stream of nullable. Uh, which just does what it says in the tin here. So it, it takes the value. If it's null, it returns you an empty stream. Otherwise, it will uh, return you a stream wrapping up that value. Awesome. Awesome. So who's a bit more of a fan of this code? Yeah. Yes, that's a room full of hands up. Does anyone have mild dislike for it? Very few. Mi amazing. Amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so I've talked about stream dot of nullable. What's what's next? Well, um, let's see what the TOC says. So we've, we've yeah. covered of nullable. We've still got a card take while, drop while, and a uh, fantastic iterate method. So let's yeah. introduce a new domain here, Richard. Some payments. We've got some. Uh, we've got some payments that are going out of our business. Uh, if I look at those values, payments, they've all got different values, haven't they? Nine hundred, seven hundred, five hundred. They're sorted by value. Yes. Right. Awesome. So what are we going to do? What's the problem to solve? Well, perhaps we don't. We want to look at some expense. We want to look at some payments. We just want to find a report where we know what the big payments are, the ones with high high values in. So can, can we perhaps code up some stream API code to, to find the high value payments? Maybe a greater than or equal to 500 pounds? Amazing. So what we want to do is to apply a predicate on each of these elements and based on that, select them or not. So we take uh, the filter operation, which is available on stream API, and it's going to take a payment. And what Richard is saying here is we're going to get the, the value. value, check if it's greater or greater than 500. Yep. And then finally collect that back into a list. Yes. Awesome. Okay. There you go. There's three payments, Richard. Okay, but that, that's kind of an okay approach if we've got, say, six payments in our list. But what if I've got a million payments and we know they're sorted? Is there any way that we can take advantage of that sort order in order to only apply the predicates for the elements beforehand? Because we know if it's sorted, but once it goes false, it's going to be false forever. That's a fantastic point. So especially if the source is uh, potentially uh, big or inf infinite, yeah, um, then we're going to be processing elements, which is not really necessary. As soon as we find that the first one is uh, s smaller than 500, hey, we can short circuit this whole operation. There's no need to process additional elements. So we could be saving some CPU time. Now, in Java 9, uh, another method was added that actually makes use of this short circuiting property. It's called take while. And Fantastic. it's going to take those elements. And as soon as this predicate here varies to false, then we can exit the operation. Awesome. Awesome. So. This, this is basically waits until that thing becomes false and then only takes the head, the elements where it's, where it's been true on. But there might also be another parallel where we perhaps want to find the lower end of the list, right? The things which are below 500. And we've got the same sorting property as well. We, we just want to wait for it to turn false and then get the tail of those elements. Is there anything we can deal with to do that? I'm glad you asked, Richard. I'm glad you asked because... There's this other method here called drop while that does exactly that. It returns you the tail from that stream. So it's quite a good way to kind of <coughs> split up an input stream as well. You've got take that gives you the head and drop that gives you the tail. So the, with the uses we've shown here for take while and drop while, they kind of assume that there's a defining counter order in the stream, right? You know the order of the elements and it's, it's meaningful because they're sorted. What about if they're unsorted? Is there anything we can, we can do there? Well, Richard, you might think of a situation where maybe you're reading um, data over the network or from a service continuously, so you're streaming information. And at some point, you want to be able to exit from this operation. Flip maybe it off. Flip it off, based on a flag or maybe based on a, a disconnect event that happened. At this point, you need to kind of switch up right. the stream. That's what take while is handy as well. So you could check that flag inside your take while, flip it off, and then it's done. Indeed, indeed. Absolutely. That makes really good sense, especially in the case of infinite streams, right? Streams which are generated from some computational function, like stream.iterate. 
Oh, I'm glad you mentioned stream.etrade widget because that's another uh, interesting factory method that was added in Java 8. So just so we all have kind of a recap, um, if you want to generate uh, a stream of numbers like that, I'd encourage you to use range closed instead, uh, a lot cheaper. But this illustrates this example quite well. And usually it's used for accessing indexes in an array. But let's say we generate a bunch of numbers here, which we are just going to print out. And the way it e works here is that it gives you an infinite stream. All those numbers are being generated one after the other one. And I exited the, the, the process here. That's why we start. So you control right? seed it to start. I control seed it, indeed. OK, OK. Well, that's cool. But um, suppose you don't have a REPL in your production system where you're going to control C your code manually. And you've got these infinite stream things. How would we say stop once we've seen 10 values? Well, SQL to the rescue. Uh, there is this uh, operation called limit Amazing. Uh, that you can use to kind of truncate uh, the size of your, of your stream to something as a, a bounded size. So in this case, a limit 10, just give me 10 elements. OK, but the, the, the limit operation here is operating on the number of elements that we've seen. <clears throat> what about if we say, say we add 2 each time, and we want to stop it when the value is below 10. So we'll see 0, 2, 4, 6, blah, 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 but stuff less than 10. Can we use that filter operation from the Java 8 streams API, perhaps, to, to check the predicate? Well, let's, let's have a go, right? Filter is for applying a predicate. It's going to mm -hmm. select those elements. So if we run this, we'll get 0, 2, 5, 6, 8. But importantly, you can see the program here is not exiting, right? It's still carrying it's on. It's still going on. Absolutely. So that's, that's a bit of a problem, right? You don't want to just have uh, a program that's sitting there, burning CPU, running forever. Now. If we'd actually left that run on for ages and ages and ages, the ints that it's continually incrementing would eventually overflow, go negative, and you'd actually start seeing negative numbers come out of the bottom as well. Um, so that's not very ideal either, is it? Uh, so perhaps we can use those take while or drop while operators that we saw earlier to, to solve this problem. So take while is a good candidate because, again, it has this short circuiting property. So we we'll apply this predicate. As soon as the value is too false, then we can the close line. the stream. Is there anything better than doing an iterate in a take while? Well, some programming languages have got this kind of list comprehension feature. Uh, I don't know if anyone's a fan of Haskell here, but you can kind of build up this list by giving a predicate as well on top of giving yeah. a iteration kind of a function. So I think there's about as many fans as Haskell as there are Welsh people in the room, if I'm being <laughs> honest. Uh, but yes, the list comprehension, the list comprehension factor. Uh, so we'll, you perhaps want to say a predicate that, that limits the bound of the list that you're going to generate, and then a function to get you the next um, entry. And the new version of uh, iterate that was added in Java 9 has this uh, overload version that takes an argument, which is your predicate. And what that's going to do is to use that to filter out the elements, but again, has this nice short circuiting property so we don't get an infinite stream. Awesome, awesome. So we've talked about streams for a little bit, <clears throat> but there was another feature that was added in Java 8 as well, right? Collectors. And collectors go hand in hand with the stream API. So it's a really interesting way to build up uh, containers out of a stream. So when you've got a mutable reduction use case, so you want to build up a list or a map, that's where collectors uh, come in. So, so I think we've got a list of your expenses in a local variable here, haven't we? I love that you say it's my expenses, because I'm pretty sure they're yours, Richard, because yours is like a bit of expenses. entertainment here. It's definitely your see. expenses. Um, yeah, so you've got you've 2016, lots of money spent on food, entertainment, some money on utility. 2015, no utility bills whatsoever. I won't tell British Gas about that, by the way. I promise. Thank goodness that this talk isn't being recorded and going on YouTube. Um, so let's suppose we want to take those expenses and find those expenses, like the ones of the groups of different years, like the 2016 or 2015 one. What, what are we going to do for that? Well, so Richard, let's use the um, collectors API here to help us. So collect is the entry point to use collectors. And what we're going to say here is, uh, just as a refresher, can you group those purchases based on the year? And what you get as a result here is a map with the keys of the year. And the value is the list of those expenses. So the 2016 one was the food, entertainment, utility, and 2015 was just travel, entertainment. 
man, 2015 sounds fun. Wait for 2017 and 18, baby. Boom. Okay, I will do. So we've, we've got this kind of nice thing where we're kind of grouping by list, but can we do some more interesting computational tasks? Like, what I really want to know is how much money I spent in 2015, 2016. Call me materialistic, but I do want to know how much money I spent in those years. Oh, that's, that's fair enough, Richard, especially if we build an accounting software, those kind of information we need to know. So um, the good news is that this collector's um, framework here is really composable. So we can have a second argument here that's going to say, well, why don't you sum all the um, amounts, I believe. Uh, and if we run this, what you'll find out here is that for the year 2016, you spent a lot of money. Yeah, living at large, mainly with a large utility bill. But, you know, living at large in some sense. Amazing. So that's a refresher for the collectors and how you can use them. What about Java 9? What about Java 9? Well, I saw in our uh, table of contents that there was, say, uh, a filtering operation uh, in Java 9, wasn't there? So mm. let's suppose, think about a filtering use case here. Suppose we take those purchases and we want to find the purchases that were, say, bigger than 700 pounds, over 1,000 pounds, the really, really big expenses and I want to group those big expenses by year. What, what was the key thing I blew my budget on in a given year? Or you blew your budget on? <laughs> All right, Richard, well, let's use the filter operation, hey, because we want to filter out um, those uh, payments, okay. uh, those purchases. And if we run this code here, what you'll find out is that in 2016, you had an expense over a thousand pound. That's my utility bill. Darn you, British gas. Darn you. Um, yes, so uh, that's kind of okay, that's useful information to know, but what happened to 2015? Did you just delete 2015? Ah, you've got eagle eyes, you've got eagle eyes. So what's happening here is that we're filtering those elements from the source, and the point is reaching the collectors, then the year 2015, that element that contains the year 2015, it's not there anymore because the amount is only 700, so it's been filtered out. So we have no way to build up that map that contains the year 2015, Richard. So, so what you're saying is you want to group by the year and then remove the elements. That's right. Don't worry, Richard. Don't worry about a thing. Because okay. in Java 9, there is another collector that was added that can help us. And it's called filtering. Excellent. I know I'm going to be happy after you've uh, mentioned this. So you take, again, this is what we call a downstream collector. You compose two collectors together. We're going to take our expense. Get the value. Get the value. So this is the same predicate that we had before. And then... It's amount, you're right. Let's get amount. And then build that up into a list. So this point now, Richard, you can see that we have this map and the key uh, is still filtering through. So we've still got the 2015 year. We still know that year exists somewhere in our system. But we know there were no big expenses in that year because it was just travel, entertainment, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Exactly. Cool, cool. Um, but I also noticed, you know, talking of travel and entertainment, we've got a few tags. We've got each of these operations tagged by what they're about. So perhaps we could take these purchases and just find out what those tags are. Well, so what we want to do here now is to extract uh, some data from the input. So that sounds like a Absolutely. job for, for map, right? Map is this okay. pattern where you can do a transformation from one element to the other one or extract uh, some data. So let's say we get our expense. And what you really want is just to extract the tags, right? Yeah. And then collect that back into a list. Awesome. There you go. Now, what you've got there is not really a list, is it? It's a list with lists in. I know you like lists, Raoul. I know you like lists. But this is too much. This is too much lists. Do you want some set, maybe? No, it's not really solving the problem. What I want is, what I want is one collection with all the elements in. All right, all right. Well, guess what's your favorite friend? Flat map. Flat map. Flat map, indeed. So what we're going to do here... Who are you going to call? Flat map. <laughs> It'd be a good TV show. You did there. Uh, so again, flat map is this operation that takes a function that returns a stream, and then we'll flatten all those intermediate streams. So what we're going to do here is to say, well, 
give me all the tags, make a stream out of that. The next element, give me all the tags, and we're going to get one continuous stream of all the tags, so we don't have this nested list anymore. Okay. And then finally, to set here, we'll ensure that we've got unique uh, elements. Awesome, awesome. So this is flatten the elements down, put them into one big set. Entertainment, food, utility, travel. Awesome. I'm not spending any money on computers, but that's okay. That's okay. Now, what about, we've got these tags. We had this thing earlier, we saw the years. So can we find the tags that caused our expenses in a given year, perhaps? Well, let's uh, use the collector framework again, because okay. now we're interested in building a, a mapping. So what we're going to do is to group by. Then you're saying by, by the year. There's another collector which is called mapping. It actually lets you do this extraction mechanism. So we're going to say mapping, and here we want to extract the tags into uh, a set. Okay. And then if you're a fan of Lisp, you love collectors because you really need to get your parentheses right. And there you go. Awesome. Um, but this is still lists of lists. It is. Can we? I like lists, but I don't like too many lists. Let's, let's get them flattened back down again. All right. So we had mapping. Can someone guess what we're going to have in Java 9? Flat, Flat mapping. Flat mapping, yes. Yes. Amazing. Well, let's, let's give that a go. So, Richard, all I'm going to do here is to replace this mapping with flat mapping. Okay. okay. So, flat mapping. Boom. Uh -oh. Ooh. Now, normally when I see a generics error on screen, I read out the full generics error just to emphasize how long and complicated and unreadable it is. But if I do that, we're going to take up the remaining 19 minutes of this talk. So I won't do that and simply point out that flat mapping needs to take a, s a function to a stream in order to flat map, just like flat map took a function to a but stream. Richard, let, let's be fair here, right? If we look at this area here that I've highlighted, it tells you that, well, you return a list of tag, and what we want is a stream of something, right? So it's kind of yeah. helpful. It's kind of helpful. So um, let's... Stream question mark sends you. <laughs> let's, let's fix that up. And instead of having this expense get tags here, what we're going to do is to provide a lambda expression that will return a stream. So we okay. take our expense, we get the tags, and then we stream that. Okay. Now, if we run this again, what yes. do we see? Yes, from the year to the different expenses, we can add the expenses up, we can find the big things, we can find the tags. I can sack my accountant. Yes, save even more money. Boom. So that's wrapping up for collectors. And uh, Richard, the, you know, one of the data type that I'm a really big fan of, because it's really helpful for modeling, is option, right? Models the presence or absence of a value and force me to deal with the scenario where there may not be a value if I need to. Yeah. Makes my API more comprehensible. You know, the stream API, it supports optional when say find first or find any. There may not be an element in that stream. So really useful data type. So make it sexy in Java 9. Absolutely. So we're going to evolve our property lookup example from earlier. I'm going to have a property uh, a setting class, and where we look up the setting by a name, which is the name of the property, and that will return an optional with a value in if it's present, and nothing in if it's absent. So that's the user home example. And if I just say a property I haven't set at home, it's empty. Okay. So let's evolve that earlier exa earlier example to use those settings. So if I take a uh, stream, take given that app home and given that user home, I can map those values using the uh, lookup setting by name method <coughs> reference, and that's going to return me an optional. So if I want to check, I want to get rid of optionals that are empty here. So you have some empties and some are not, and there is method called is present, right? That you can use here to uh, check the state of that. Uh, Optional object? Absolutely. And then I need to unbox the optional. So I need to remove elements that are. I don't actually want an optional within an optional here. So I want to unbox the optional to remove the values. So I've just got the value of the setting objects in the stream. And then I'm going to do a find first at the end. OK. Awesome. Awesome. We've looked at the setting. We found the first one. We've wrapped it up in the setting. And we've got that returned at the end. Richard, is it, is it really awesome? 
Um, it feels a bit like an anti-pattern here, mm, right? That's Ex true, actually. Ex explicitly poking the state of the object. This is definitely not um, option. This is definitely not awesome. This is definitely moving into the mildly annoying territory, I think. Mm. So we've got this is present and get, and using the is present and get in combination with each other is a bit of an anti-pattern, right? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't feel like any improvement from what we had before Java 8, before the optional data type yeah. was introduced, where we're essentially doing an explicit check, and based on that, we are ma applying operations. So it looks like we're managing the control flow here, whereas what we want to do is to let the API figure out by building a recipe. Absolutely. But there's actually quite a convenient method added in Java 9 for this very purpose. So if what we do, instead of doing the is present and get, what we can do is we can flat map each optional. And there's a stream method added in Java 9. So that will convert it into a stream. It's got, if it's got the one element in, the stream will contain the one element. If the optional is empty, the stream will be empty. So we'll do that. And then, uh, then find first. Then find first at the end. Gives us the same result, but it's a much nicer pattern for filtering optionals out of streams to flat map them into a stream. Not only that, it provides a way to convert from an option to a stream. If you need to, if you've got some API that makes use of stream, you've got a nice kind of entry point here. Um, so I think one of the takeaways of this talk is flat map is definitely your friend in Java 9. There's more flat map, and there will be more flat map in the future as well. Absolutely. Loads of flat map. So uh, another thing which I do quite a lot of, and you do quite a lot of, is travel, right? Book flights fly from one place to another. So let's pick a little booking reference here from, say, London City Airport to Antwerp. Um, and I've actually got a little class here that will take our booking, and it will look up bookings given the reference. So if I provide uh, London City to Antwerp, it'll give me an optional wrapping up the booking. And suppose my uh, booking ref was from Cardiff to Antwerp, we will have an empty optional. Maybe that's why there was no one from Wales in the room, because there are no flights from Cardiff to Antwerp. Maybe, okay. maybe, Richard, maybe. Maybe, maybe. But I've also got like a little UI class with a fancy 2017-oriented UI that will display me my check-in page and also my missing booking page. So if I take my uh, uh, booking reference... So you want to say, if it's present, then maybe... Display check-in. Absolutely. So let's let's flip back to the London City to Antwerp booking. So I can say if present using the optional API already, take the UI and display the check-in page. Fantastic. So we see we're checking in from London City to Antwerp, but if I'm going from Cardiff to Antwerp, and I use the same operation, just displays me nothing at all. Richard, that's not really a great user experience here, right? You no. will say, well, if it's not present, then display something else. Display missing booking page. So if present or else do something, right? That's kind of what you Let's want to write. Let's just try it? typing that and see if it works. Mm. Amazing. Awesome. Missing. So there was a, another method added to optional called if present or else that takes a couple of different callbacks. The first one is uh, the operation to do if there's a value inside the optional, the kind of true case, and the second one is the missing, the empty optional case as well. Reads like English. I love it. Awesome. Yes. Um, so there's one more thing that we need to look at, and that is finding the addresses of clients, right? So let's suppose we have a string here, which is going to be the client's name, and for reasons unknown, they're going to be called a client. Um, and what I've got here is a couple of methods. So I can look up the company details, and I can find the client. So we've got different levels of address book here. Firstly, the company name in question could actually genuinely be a client, in which case they'll be in our client database. Or maybe they're a company who we can look up the address of, say, publicly on the internet, or with Google, or the uh, yellow pages. No, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, we, with, with some other database of addresses, and maybe it's just not a company name. Maybe it's a typo. Maybe they've renamed their company, whatever. So we've got a couple of different lookups here. So we can find the client, and if they're a, a client, it'll return us their address in London. 
let's suppose the client is another company, so that's somebody who's not a client, but is just another company, uh, then running that find client will return us the empty optional to say we don't know who this company is, but I'll look up company details that backs off to say the public database of addresses will return us their address, and that's in Cambridge. So Richard, it sounds like you want to be able to chain up those two operations together, right? If, if we fail to look up the client, mm. uh, then here's another way to look it up using the company details. That's yeah. what you to specify. So there was a method called or else get, wasn't there, uh, in Java 8? There's or else and or else get. And that would let us do some code on the, the empty value and say, for example, uh, look up the company details on the client. So let's try using that and see what happens. Well, oh, we have a pretty reasonable error message here. It's saying, look, you, you want uh, a function that is returning a client object, because that's what the, the was in the optional itself, and you've returned an optional of a client, because you know, that lookup operation might fail. And or else get doesn't meet these use cases. It has to have a callback that definitely succeeds rather than returning an optional itself. Is there a Java 9 feature that helps us solve this problem? Well, I'm quite curious about Java 8. There's this other method called or else, quite simply. What would happen if we just run or else and we remove this supplier here? Just like that. Yeah. We get the same problem because or else has to take a value. It doesn't even take a function to return. OK. I know, Richard. I know. So we've got or else, we've got or else get. What about just or? Will that work? Ooh. Let's try that one. Fantastic. So or was a method that was added in Java 9. And or will take a function that will, again, return an option on itself. So if the client, if say our client was a client, this would return us London. If it was another company, it would return us Cambridge, as shown there. Um, or there's also a third option, which is, uh, suppose this is just some kind of typo. And that will return us an empty, because typo is not a company name here, right? Fantastic. Fantastic. So, well, Richard, um, we talked a lot about you know, those new additions that yeah. were introduced in Java 9. So help us make our code more readable, close the problem statement, helps productivity. That's great. So we've talked about new things that were added. But what about things that were removed? Things that were removed? That's an interesting question, because we bumped into Alex Buckley earlier, didn't we? And he told us, guys, you need to make a last minute change to your talk uh, 45 minutes before it starts. So yeah, we thought, let's do that. That's a brilliant idea. Hold on, hold on. That's on. not the real story. That is not the real story. OK. So we had a chat with, with Alex, and you're saying, Oh, great, you need to make some modification to your presentation. And we then said, oh, but we have no slides. And Alex said, even better, you don't have to change anything. You can just talk about it. <laughs> no changes required. Um, yes, which isn't entirely true. So there is some code that's been uh, removed. There's deprecations. Uh, there's even Dr. Deprecator in the room who loves deprecating code. Um, but there's also code which looks like it's been removed in Java 9, but actually hasn't been removed in Java 9, or is at least shipping as part of the JDK for the moment. Like Jaxby. Jaxby, any, anyone using the base 64 encoder and decoder here? Or uh. some of those people, but also anyone using Jaxby or the XML binding libraries at all. That's a, more, that's a larger number of people. Okay, so we're just going to use an example uh, class here. So suppose we try and import the uh, javax.xml.bind.data type converter. So this is a class that some people use in JAXB, which is for base64 encoding, because there used to be a Sun MISC base64 encoder, which actually did get removed uh, in Java 9. And the problem here is this data type isn't visible. It's in this module, Java X, XML bind, which isn't loaded at all. And I think the point I want to make here, really, is that there is code that looks like it's been removed in Java 9, but hasn't really been removed in Java 9. Because, oh, uh, slash exit. Yeah, because we can come along to the command line, or when you declare your modules at compile time, you can add a require on, and you can say, look, add modules, Java 
dot XML dot bind. And then it imports without error. So there is also, as well as new code, there's other code that's still there in the JDK that can be used if you add the modules for things like JAXB. Though, I will say, be a little bit careful because there is actually an impending JEP to remove the JAXB from the JDK itself. So you'll need to use Maven or something to import it. And for that case, you need to use something like the Java Util Base64 class for Base64 encoding that was added in Java 8. Fantastic. So in this talk, uh, we covered a number of different core library updates, right? We did. So we covered the collection factories, the stream API, collectors, optional. There's other enhancements uh, that we've not covered, including to the completable future uh, class. Uh, if you want to find out about the other editions, though, we, Richard and I, we've written a few articles on this topic on our website, so iteratorlearning.com with the O. And what you'll see is, you know, we're talking about the new process API that was added in Java 9. Um, and you can also find code samples that we've used in this talk in those articles and on our GitHub, which is linked from the website. Okay? So I hope you guys have all enjoyed this talk. I hope you've seen that there's more to Java 9 as an update than just Project Jigsaw. We've seen some live coding in the JShell REPL, and we've seen a bunch of core library improvements as well. So I hope you enjoyed all of those, and thank you very much for being a great audience. <laughs> if anyone has any questions, there's about three and a half minutes left in this time slot. So put your hands up. In fact, wave your hands about if you've got a question to ask. Or feel free to grab us. Afterwards. Come down after the talk. We're That's going to stick around fine. for a bit. OK. Bye. <laughs>